Good Saturday morning. This is my Saturday morning cartoon, I guess. This is a Valentine's Day card Constance got for me a couple of years ago. With a very personal message on the inside. But it was about the time the Son of Chicken Kabbalah came out, and it was just, just perfect. Uh, and I'm putting it up for no other reason than I ran across it while I was looking for uh, for uh, other things. Happy Eid al hada La ilaha illallah Muhammad al-Rasulullah. I'm sure I said that flawlessly. Anyway, it's a big holiday for our Muslim friends. Uh, you know, yesterday I got I got to admit that I'm uh, uh, going to be working out of this uh, the Book of Thoth uh, again today uh, because I just can't get away. It's just so good. Uh, actually, I was putting it away while trying to uh, go, go get something else. I wanted to. Uh, uh, I was toying with revisiting the uh, Old Testament uh, Song of Solomon. Now I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about you or how long ago you read the Song of Solomon, but that thing is absolutely awesomely hornily uh, uh, crazy. I, I don't. I don't know why. I'm happy they did, but I don't know why it was uh, included in the canonical uh, canonical uh, selections of books of the Bible. But it's flat out erotica. It's it's universal erotica. It's uh, and it's written in such a way. Okay, it has the same ring to it and the same same irrational. Uh, imagery uh, uh, that uh, Crowley's holy books, the books that, that he received rather than uh, the books that he just, you know, uh, wrote outright. And uh, so anyway, I was, I was, I got out my old Masonic Bible, or my own Masonic Bible anyway, and uh, was reading through as sort of a version of the King James. And it's just, I thought it was going to be a short little read, but I'm going to have to say, maybe I'll save it for Sunday school uh, tomorrow, but, uh, or at a later date. Right now, uh, because of reaction and some comments uh, left uh, from yesterday's uh, uh, talk concerning the vital triads of the, of the tarot trumps, uh, the question has come up on uh, uh, about re actually reading tarot cards, which is, let's face it, most people uh, get initially interested in tarot because uh, they want to read tarot cards for them for themselves. They want to divine uh, for their friends. They want to be a gypsy fortune teller. Not that, not that there's anything wrong with Gypsy Fortune Tellers, one of the greatest tarot reader in the world that I know, does the classic, dresses up, has a tent, everything else. And she's paid very well for it, too. And she's a, a fabulous reader. Uh, so please don't let me, you know, uh, cast negative aspersions on Gypsy Fortune Tellers. But uh, when it comes right down to it, if uh, in the final analysis, uh, you don't learn to read tarot cards, uh, actually read tarot cards uh, by studying what the, the buzzwords that each of the cards would represent. Oh, this this card is a, usually indicates a trip by water. Well, not that it doesn't. 
but it, reading tarot cards is more than memorization of, of uh, quick definitions of 78 cards and their relative meaning when put in, when spread out in a field where each field uh, has a specific meaning of its own. Uh, the very first thing nearly approaching tarot that I had was when Constance and I were, were uh, young hippies uh, living with no electricity or plumbing out in the, the woods of Southern Oregon. And one of our hippie friends had a, had a tarot uh, deck called the Morgan Tarot. And it was very, very, very cute. Uh, actually, it's still <laughs> really, really good. Uh, and uh, it had a little booklet that went with it and uh, which talked about the, the Celtic cross spread. Now that's, that's a field. Uh, you got one card like that, that's number one, then number two crosses it, then you got above that conscious stuff or below that subconscious stuff to the, to the right. What forces happen in the, the uh, immediate past to the left, how that's likely to develop. And then there's a line of cards that uh, one of them's you, one of them's your environment, one of them's your hopes and fears, and the final one up on top is the uh, likely outcome. And then each of those cards, they have a goofy little thing. Uh, they weren't the classic meanings. Then we also got another little, uh, little game called Gong Hee Fat Choi. And then that, that was, uh, you opened up a spread of uh, uh, a, a grid of uh, actually blank rectangles, okay? And uh, uh, each of the rectangles was, was labeled uh, with, a, with a certain label. And then you use the uh, a deck or uh, a certain number of just regular playing cards. And then they'd say, oh, the ace of uh, spades in the house of so-and-so means, and then there was a book that you opened up. is written in the 20s or 30s. Really cool. Still works. Blows your mind. Gang hi fat choi. It's still, still available. Okay. The title of my little talk today is something like uh, uh, let the tarot cards teach you how to read tarot cards and that's exactly what I mean. A book won't teach you how to read tarot cards. Another tarot teacher won't teach you how to read tarot cards. The only If you're going to read tarot cards eventually it'll be because the cards taught you how to read tarot cards. And for years I used uh, uh, the Crowley deck with uh, uh, the Celtic cross spread. And uh, it got me used to uh, knowing the behavior of the cards uh, when, I, when I read for others. And I'd read for others just as friends. I didn't do it professionally or anything else. I tried to read for myself, but hey, I lie to myself so much. It just doesn't work for me. I just go, oh, the tower. Oh, I was hoping for that. Oh, cross by death and the nine of swords. Mm, my lucky day, you know. Uh, but uh, after a while, I, I got to know how each of these cards uh, behaves vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, spe specific questions, specific, specific issues. Not only that, that, but over time, I could see 
I began to see an actual uh, process whereby the cards actually were producing, were predicting the future. So it's, you know, the future is always, or the, uh, uh, your divinations are always 100% correct in hindsight. Well, you got to get a few years of hindsight under your belt before you see, oh, yeah, that Eight of Swords, which is such a pain in the ass, <laughs> you're, and you're so unhappy to see it, is really not all that bad. Because even in such and such a, uh, a situation, I recall that, yes, that answered my question. Yes, this project will be a pain in the ass. Yes, it'll be like pulling teeth every step of the way. Yes, I'll have high anxiety over this particular project. But it just turns out that it, the result of the project was the best thing I ever did, the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, it predicted the unfolding of objective reality, and frankly so. But the big, oh, I want everything just to go so smoothly and I want to be happy. No, it's things like that. The cards begin to teach you how to read the cards. And so once you get uh, 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 familiar with the cards themselves, much, when you become uh, accustomed to reading cards for other people and allowing your own uh, stream of consciousness to tumble out of your mouth as you're uh, laying out the cards and describing them uh, to, uh, to your client, you begin to see how the cards are teaching you how to read the cards. They are a living magical entity in themselves. Anything that's perfect is a living magical entity. So eventually, over after 35 years or so of, of reading tarot cards, it just occurred to me my own little spread, my own little technique of, of reading tarot cards. It's sort of a lawns go with the flow. Starts as a three card reading that could expand, but uh, it, it's sort of organic and it's the way I read cards now. But while learning, I tried various spread spreads, Celtic cross being the first one. And then when I became more impressed with uh, the brilliance of Aleister Crowley and the magnificence of the Thoth Tarot, I said, I'm going to try to read like Aleister Crowley read. Now, how did he do it? And sure enough, in the back of this book, the Book of Thoth, in one of the appendices, if I can find it, he's got a, an article called The Behavior of the Tarot. And I'm going to read it to you. And we'll see how Crowley suggests, and it's based on a, a Golden Dawn uh, he didn't just make this up whole cloth. This is the way uh, McGregor Mathers, I think, or Golden Dawn Boys came up with this particular spread. But anyway, behavior of the tarot. It being now established at the conclusion of the essay that the cards of the tarot are living individuals. It's proper to consider the relations which obtain between them and the student. Consider the analogy of a debutante at her coming out ball. Now, not all of us were in that level of society 
especially in those days, to, to actually identify with that circumstance. But try to use your imagination. Consider the analogy of a debutante at her coming out ball. She's introduced to 78 grown people. Assuming her to be a particularly intelligent girl with a very high social education, she may know all about the position and general characteristics of these people. This, however, will not imply real knowledge of any one of them. She will have no means of saying how any one will react to her. At most, she can know only a few facts from which deductions may be made. It is unlikely, for example, that the VC will hide in the cel cellar if somebody thinks there is a burglar in the house. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what VC is, okay? It is improbable that the bishop will indulge in, the, in more blatant types of blasphemy. The position of the student of the tarot is very similar. In this essay and in these designs is given an analysis of the general character of each card, but he cannot reach any true appreciation of them without observing their behavior over a long period, just like Lon said. He can only come to an understanding of the tarot through experience. It will not be sufficient for him to intensify his study of the cards as objective things. He must use them. He must live with them. They too must live with him. A card is not isolated from its fellows. The reactions of the cards, their interplay with each other, must be built into the very life of the student. How? Then how is he to use them? How is he to blend their life with his? The ideal way is that of contemplation. But this involves initiation of such a high degree that it's impossible to describe the method in this place, of course. Nor is it either attractive or suitable to most people. The practical, everyday, commonplace way is divination. The traditional technical method of divination by tarot here follows. It's taken from Equinox, Volume 1, Number 8. And its publication is authorized by O.M. Adeptus Exemptus. And that's Crowley's handle as Adeptus Exemptus. Number one, the significator. Choose a card to represent the querent. Using your knowledge or judgment of his character rather than dwelling on his physical characteristics. Elsewhere in uh, the Book of Thoth, uh, you can see which cards would represent the period of time that the queer was born in. And as an arbitrary uh, uh, significator, one could choose the either the knight, queen, and uh, prince of each suit. And they each represent uh, 30 degrees of the zodiac, 20 degrees of one sign to 20 degrees of the next. You could uh, for, for instance, I'm a queen of cups because my birthday is July 11th. Oh, I let that slip. This close to my birthday. I, I, I like to keep my birthday July 11th. Uh, okay. That's the significator, though. And Crowley says, use your own judgment. Does this guy uh, look like and have the same characteristics that I would expect from uh, the fire of earth 
aspect of the Knight of Discs, you know, whatever it is, whatever your technique, do it and stick to it for a few years or decades. Take the cards in your left hand. In the right hand, hold the wand over them and say, I invoke thee, Eao, that thou wilt send through the great angel that is set over operations of this secret wisdom, to lay his hands invisibly upon this consecrated cards of art, that thereby we may attain true knowledge of hidden things, to the glory of thine ineffable name. Amen. Now, you may not think you, you worship E.A.O. or anything like that. Or that doesn't make any sense to you. Who the hell's through? But you do want to have part of you plug into the big whatever it is in the universe. It's the Solomonic formula. If you're not plugged into what's above you and that which you are within, you're not going to be able to, to uh, uh, be a conduit of that, that force, of that energy. So that's why, you know, if you're a Christian, say a nice little prayer to, to Jesus or the saints or something like that. Whatever it is, consecrate those cards. Have a greater source than you currently believe you are uh, at work here. Okay, so after you've done the, the invocation, hand the cards to the querent and bid him think of the question attentively and then cut and I'm assuming you have the querent cut then take the cards as cut and hold them as for dealing the first operation and this first operation shows the situation of the querent at the time when he consults you. Five-minute conversation could do that. <laughs> but I, I'm cynical. This first operation shows the situation of the querent at the time when he consults you. The pack being in front of you cut and place the top half to the left. Cut each pack again to the left. These four stacks represent yod he vav he, from right to left. Find the significator. In other words, go through each of those stacks to find the significator. If it be in the yod pack, and that one would be the, the pack on the far, or the stack on the far right. If it be in the yod pack, the question refers to work, business, etc. If in the hay pack, to love, marriage, or pleasure. If in the vav pack, to trouble, loss, scandal, quarreling, etc. If in the hay final pack, to money, goods, and such purely material matters. Tell the querent what he has come for. If wrong, abandon the divination. Go home, leave my tent. You're in the wrong stack. You should be in the haystack. That'll be $50. If correct, though, spread out the pack, literally 
spread out the pack containing the significator face upwards. Find the significator. Now the significator will be a court card. Crowley doesn't tell you that here. Lon is telling you that here because he goes on to say and start counting the cards from the direction he faces. Each of the, the, the court cards face left or right or left or right or left or right. Or it might mean this, the querence. But if the querent is facing you, <laughs> that doesn't work. If the querent is on your left and going that way, start counting that way. It's on your, your right. You get it. You start counting the cards. And the counting should include the card from which you count. So if you've got the Queen of Cups starting right there, you count four for a court card. So you actually put your finger right on the Queen of Cups and go one, two, three, four. And that's the first card in the reading. So for knights, queens, and princes, count four. For princesses, count seven. For aces, count 11. And for the small cards, count according to the number. For the trumps, count three for the elemental trumps, Aleph Memshin. Nine for the planetary trumps. And 12 for the zodiacal trumps. Make a story of these cards. This story is that of the beginning of the affair. Now that's some pretty heavy imaginatory creative work to do. It almost would take a Stephen King to make up a story like that. One, two, three, four. Ah, the six of discs. The expansion of money into your life. It's the six of discs, so then count six. One, two, three, four, five, six. The tower. Ah, you're going to get use that money and get blasted, man. Anyway. That's pretty heroic stuff, and I hope you're being paid by the minute. Because we're not through. Then pair the cards on either side of the significator. Oh, we got a five of discs over here, and we've got a nine of swords on the other side of you. Oh, there's it. then you make up a, a more of a story. And then you take the cards to the left and right of each of those and make up another story. And the cards to the left and right of each of those and make up another story. Okay, pair the cards on either side of the significator, then those outside of them, and so on. Make another story, which should fill in the details of... Uh, that were omitted in the first. But if the story is not quite accurate, don't be discouraged. Perhaps the querent himself does not know everything. Duh. But the main lines ought to be laid down firmly with correctness. If not, the divination should be abandoned. Leave my tent. No more today. Don't forget to put your shoes on. The second operation, the development of the question. Shuffle, invoke suitably, and let the querent cut as before. Deal the cards out into 12 stacks for the 12 astrological houses of heaven. 
Make up your mind in which stack you ought to find the significator. In other words, in the seventh house, if the question concerns marriage, etc. Examine this chosen stack. If the significator is there, is not there, try some cognate house. Uh, on a second failure, abandon the operation. Now, I wasn't very good at doing this type of uh, uh, technique at all. I was really good, though, at abandoning the divination. Read the stack counting and pairing as before. After breaking for lunch, the third operation. Further development of the question. Shuffle, etc., as before. Deal the cards into 12 stacks for the 12 signs of the zodiac. Divine the proper stacks and proceed as before. The penultimate aspects of the question is the fourth operation. Shuffle, etc., as before. Find the significator, set him upon the table. Let the 36 cards following form a ring around him. Hopefully it's a big table. Count and pair as before. Note that the nature of each decan is shown by the small card attributed to it. And by symbols uh, found in Liber 418, or, uh, well, 777, uh, columns 149 through 151. Fifth operation, the final result. Shuffle as before. Deal into ten packs in the form of the Tree of Life. Make up your mind where the significator should be as before. But failure does not here necessarily imply that the divination has gone astray. Count and pair as before. Note that one cannot tell at what part of the divination the present time occurs. Usually, operation one seems to indicate the past history of the question, but not always so. Experience will teach. Sometimes a new current of high help may show the moment of consultation. I may add that in material matters this method is extremely valuable. I have made, have been able to work out the most complex problems in minute detail, Crowley says, says Frater O.M. It is quite impossible to obtain satisfactory results from this or any other system of divination until the art is perfectly re, uh, required. It is the most sensitive, difficult, and perilous branch of magic. The necessary conditions, which, uh, with a comprehensive comparative review of all important methods in use, are fully described and discussed in Magic, Chapter 17. And here's a paragraph he might have started the whole thing off with. The abuse of divination has been responsible more than any other cause for the discredit into which the whole subject of magic had fallen when the Master Therian un undertook the task of its rehabilitation. Those who neglect his writings and profane the sanctuary of transcendental, transcendental art have no other than themselves to blame for the formidable and ir irremediable disasters which infallibly will destroy them. Prospero is Shakespeare's reply to Dr. Faustus. Okay, please don't think that I am ridiculing or making fun of uh, this or any other uh, technique of, of divination. But I just confessing 
from a practical point of view, and I'm a very lazy and simple man, that it, it just didn't do anything for me. And the gods know I tried, tried to make it work. And because I'm a former musician, I've had lengthy periods of unemployment and lots of time on my hand <laughs> over the years to do this. And before I gave it up completely, what I did was simply the first part of each of those operations. In other words, I did cut the deck into yod heh vav -He, and I did find where the significator was, and I made note of that. And I did spread the cards out. I did observe the cards around it. I did shuffle again, and I did deal them out into uh, 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 12 stacks, a ring of 12 for the 12 houses of the zodiac, and I did find the significator, or locate the significator in one of those houses, and I made note of the house. And then I did shuffle and cut and everything else again and deal them again out into 12, uh, a circle of 12. And I found which card it was, uh, the significator in the zodiacal house. And I made note of that. Now I know a little bit about astrology and I know a little bit about uh, uh, the subtleties of, or, or the significance of uh, the houses and the significance of the uh, signs of the zodiac along with uh, general rulership, planetary rulership and exaltations and and uh, and I did that and I did lay them out in 36 for the, the, the decans. And finally, I did shuffle and dealt out the entire deck in a tree of life. And I located with Sephira in the tree of life. Uh, I found the significator. And it's there. After distilling the cards through that process, through yod heh vav -Hey, through the 12, through the 12, through the 36, through the 10. I found it in the 10 stack and I spread the 10, where I found it in the tree of life, I spread that stack, stack out face up, found the significator, cut the deck there, and starting with the significator, did a simple tarot spread of some kind. Then after a while, I just stopped doing all of that and just shuffled, found the significator and did it from there. Now, that's been working for me, okay? About 20 years ago, I started doing it that way. And it worked for me. Works fine for me, as good as I can expect from being such a, you know, funky person. The, but perhaps the reason it, it works so well for me with that abbreviated uh, uh, tarot spread was because for the 20 years before that, I was doing, <laughs> I was doing all that other stuff, okay? That's like asking somebody, uh, uh, you know, well, if your magic works, why aren't you a millionaire? You know, well, compared to how broke I could be, yeah, I am a millionaire, you know. Uh, so the cards work on you. 
they work on you more than you work <laughs> with with them and the cards teach you the tar cards have taught me anyway that's it i've gone way over i've digressed and everything else but uh, uh tomorrow we'll do something uh more spiritual perhaps for sunday school so until tomorrow Continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. Monday is my birthday.